What's going on, everyone? I'm Chris Baker. And I'm Ty Backer. Welcome to episode 132 of Behind the Tool Belt with TC Backer Construction. Backer family, welcome to episode 132. I hope you guys are having a great week. First, I want to start out by giving Johnny Stouffer a shout out on that new intro video, man. That thing is sick. Yeah, it is. It looks great. You did a great job, man. Um, like I said, hopefully everyone's enjoying their week. Um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna start off with a banger here tonight, man. We got Steve Patrick. Um, he's he's actually mobile right now, headed to Houston. How you doing, Steve? I am well. You look good, brother. How are you guys? We're doing How good. Are you guys? Real great, good. man. We're, we're in the sunshine state of old Pennsylvania up here. We hear you're down in uh, <laughs> Texas. Look at that tan. Is yes, that sir. Is that a natural tan, or is that is that something you've been working on for a while? No, I don't. You know, you get out and you look on a roof here and there and yonder, and walk around outside a little bit, and you probably get a little sun. Yeah, I'll it is remember. summer. It is summer. That's right. Thank God for that. <laughs> Yes, it is, man. Yeah, it's summer yeah. inside the studio right now, man. Shoot, it is. I'm sweating my balls <laughs> off right now. So, Steve, let's y'all done a hundred. Y'all done 132 episodes. That's a lot of episodes. Yeah, yeah. well, 131. You're 132nd, man. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's really impressive. Yeah. yeah, it is, and that's consecutively, like every single week, come hell or high water, through floods, through hail, through rain, through storms, through everything. Yes. Power outages. We've we've been able to pull it off 131 yes. times. There's three things in this world that are guaranteed, Steve. You know what they are? You got to pay taxes. You uh, got to die. And behind the tool belt yeah. is Wednesdays at seven. <laughs> that's just what it is, dog. <laughs> Excellent. I like that. Yeah. I, like hey, that. I just made that, that up. Something you grab hold of. <laughs> This, that ain't gonna move. That's yes, right. yes, sir, yes, sir. Well, it's a pleasure having you on here, man. I'm gonna learn a lot about you. Normally, we get some time to, to to really dive into the guests and all that kind of stuff prior. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you, man, I did not have much time today to really dig into who you are. So I'm gonna learn a lot about you here today, if that's okay. okay. Ask okay. a lot of personal sure. questions and really get to the nitty gritty well, of who good. Steve Patrick that, that's is. That's more authentic and genuine, yeah, you know, and, and Steve can tell us about, you know, who he is, what his business is and his occupation. Yeah, absolutely. So Steve, who are you, man? If, if, if you had to describe yourself, you know, in the third person, who is Steve? Uh, well, I uh, started as a contractor 28 years ago. Um, and, um, I was working for a con man. I didn't know that he was a con man when I went to work for him. The guy was lying to my customers. My customers would catch him. He wasn't even very good at it. And they would come to me and say, why is, his name was Hal, H-A-L. And he go, why is Hal lying to us? And I go, I have no idea why he's lying to us. So I had to quit working for that guy. And so I started my own general contracting business. And I started out doing roofing at first, you know, after a hail or windstorm. Um, you know, there's so many damaged roofs, you can't swing a dead cat. 
without yeah. hitting a house that needs a needs a new roof. And that was pretty, you know, low hanging fruit to start off. And then when things got slow, uh, I would do bathroom and kitchen remodels, and I would do some fire restoration, water restoration, things of that nature. And I did that for uh, a bunch of years. And I had gotten my claims adjuster license because I started doing claims projects, you know, projects that uh, as a result of, uh, you know, a storm or a fire or water loss or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went and got my adjuster's license so that when I met an adjuster, I could pull it out and say, hey, look, I'm an adjuster too. And I could get, I found that there was an instant camaraderie because I was an adjuster as well. Mm -hmm. And I could get things, I could get those things bought a lot easier from the adjusters back in the day. You know, that's 28, 25 years ago, whatever the case may be. And that, so originally that's why I got my claims adjuster license. I sat for a three day school in Arlington, Texas, over by Six Flags, between Dallas and Fort Worth. And, uh, and I paid my $50 or whatever it was and got my adjuster's license. And, um, so we had, um, after about, I don't know, five or 10 years of doing that, we had a dry spell where we didn't have any hail or wind at all. And um, things are so slow, we were remodeling kitchens and bathrooms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're in a woman's nest for weeks on end, you wear out your welcome. And no matter how much you tell the client ahead of time that that's going to happen, they, uh, you know, <laughs> you wear out your welcome. And, uh, and then, a, then a hurricane hit Florida. Actually, three hurricanes hit the same year. This is about uh, 17, 18 years ago. And uh, so it was um, Charlie, Gene, and Ike. I, I, not Ike, but Ivan. Crazy Ivan. Ivan went across Florida, went to the Gulf of Mexico, and then went back across Florida, exactly the same place it went across the first time. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was crazy. And so my business partner at the time, Chris, he, he called me up and he goes, we're second wind here doing these kitchens and bathrooms why don't we go work this hurricane as an adjuster we have our license and it had, it had never occurred to me to work as an adjuster because i never wanted to be one that wasn't why i got my license mm -hmm. but he and i both had our license so we went and worked at hurricane and um, we did very well it, it ends up because i was really good at scoping property damage that uh i could do a, a tremendous volume of claims in a short period of time and make some pretty crazy money. Mm -hmm. uh, like my first month uh, working Hurricane, I made like $50,000 uh, $50, that month. Wow. Without having to babysit homeowners or commercial property owners. Right. And I was going, wow, this isn't too bad. And so I did that for a bunch of years. And I started, uh, they started having me train uh, field adjusters they would assign adjusters to ride with me and I would train them field, uh, field, field training officer kind of a thing and um, it seems that I have uh, I've always had the gift of teaching uh, you know that's a God given thing it's not something you brag about it's just taking complex things and boiling them down into simple easy to understand and easily digestible things it right. seems it's just very easy for me to do and so i started my own claims adjuster licensing and training school and uh i did that for about 10 years and it's funny so <laughs> i had a bunch of my students that had gone to my school originally that were like in the top one or two percent top three percent of adjusters nationwide i mean really doing very very well and uh, they would come to me and they would say you know the insurance companies aren't allowing us to do what you're teaching us to do they won't let us do the right thing they won't let us identify the insured um, and uh, I read a book called delay deny and defense I highly recommend that book by the way if you can find it, it's not in print anymore so they're because I tell people about it, they're about a hundred dollars a book now or something crazy. Um, <laughs> because they don't, it's not in front any longer. Anyway, the um, I read that book and I realized that I was wasting my time 
I mean, I love being an adjuster, and I love and helping people get their life back together. I love teaching talented people how to become claims adjusters and, and doing things right and making uh, claimants whole. And um, and once I realized that I'm wasting my time, I decided I'm going to go back to my roots. So I go across the nation like I'm doing today, um, driving down to Houston to spend two days do a private training class. Uh, sometimes I do private trainings. Uh, classes for companies. Sometimes I'll, you know, I'll do a big, huge class for um, like a manufacturer or something or supplier, and there'll be two, three, four hundred contractors mm-hmm. that come, and I'll do a two-day class or something. So anyway, that's what I do now: is I go around the nation teaching contractors um, how to deal with unreasonable claims adjusters, how to get the, you know, how to be a top performer, things of that nature. Awesome, man. Yeah, wow. Awesome. Did you say you wrote a book? Yeah, um, so when I was a claims adjuster, I wrote a five workbook set for the claims adjusters because there was no curriculum available. Mm-hmm. And so I, I looked and looked. I couldn't find any, so I just figured I'd write my own. Who would have thought I could ever be an author and be a yeah. published author and, and write books, you know? And then I wrote a book for contractors called Level the Playing Field which teaches what's really going on in the, in the background, behind the scenes, when insurance claims and how to, how to persuade claims adjusters to do the right thing, you know, whether it's a storm loss or a fire loss, a water loss, whatever the case may be, any type, right. any type of loss to a, to a house or a commercial building. That's pretty That's awesome, man. I, that, is, that is great. Yes. Man, I love doing what I do. I'm one of the most blessed people you've ever met. I, I, I literally love doing what I do. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like it, man. You definitely seem like you got a permanent smile on your face, so perma grin, and uh, you, you got the the sunshine state tan going on, and it seems like you're living the dream, brother. So Lauren actually got me some questions together, and Lauren works for us. She's our production man- manager over on the retail Excellent. side of things, and. Awesome. Uh, so one of her questions is, is why does an adjuster need to see the material invoice from the supplier? Why can't they use a line item material list from the contractor estimate? Um, so what they're, so if you're trying to get general contractors overhead and profit on a project paid and they're not wanting to pay it, they, what they do is they, they're being disingenuous. The executives are teaching these desk adjusters to say, fine, we'll pay contractors 10 and 10 over your actual cost, which means any discount you may have negotiated with either the supplier or your crews, they're saying that you have to pass along those discounts to the consumer. So let's say, let's say for example, you have a, um, a particular subcontracting crew that you send a lot of work to. You guys do mostly roof or fire and water? What do y'all do? Roofing. Yeah, roofing. Okay. All right. So let's say you have a roofing crew and you you send them so much work that you negotiate a 10% discount off of their labor. Now, let's say that the owner of that company is shrewd as well. And they say, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a 10% discount. Every 10th roof will do for free. That's still 10%, but you have to do the volume. You have to do 10 roofs. Mm-hmm. You have to do nine roofs, and the 10th the one, the labor is free. All right, so let's say that Mrs. Jones, your client, your labor is free on hers because she's the 10th one. And they ask, say, tell you what, we'll pay the overhead and profit, but you got to show us how much you're paying your labor and how much you're paying for materials. Mm-hmm. And, and it just so happens on this particular one, you're paying nothing for the labor because of the discount you negotiated with the labor company. So they want those savings passed on. So so are they, are they saying they should pay nothing for labor? Now see, in this hypothetical, they will say, I know, but because I've asked this question, they said, no, we're not saying that, but it is what they're saying. Whether, you're, whether you've negotiated a 10% discount on a per-client basis or 
every tenth one is every tenth one is free, regardless. It's a ten percent discount. What they're saying is, is whatever your raw costs are to your labor and materials, the ten and ten should be added to that. Gotcha. As if, as if you could survive on that, and you cannot. Mm-hmm. You cannot, and you certainly can't thrive on it. They don't. See, they pass along the insurance companies pass along their actual, true, general overhead to their clients. And they charge far more profit than 10%, I right. assure you. Yeah, for sure. So let's say that So let's say that because of the economies of scale, that their overhead is 18% and their profit is 20%, let's say. All right? So guess what? They add in the 18% overhead into their price, and they add in their 20% profit into their price. And that's just built in. It's not separated out. It's not this much insurance premium plus overhead profit. It's right. just here's the price. Here's the price. In fact, there's no business that separates out overhead and profit in their pricing. In fact, hospitals don't do that, and they do insurance claims all day long every day. Mm-hmm. Body shop body shops don't do that. They don't separate out their overhead and their profit from their price. It's just a price. Right. And um, so why do we do that? Why have we... <laughs> Imagine going to... I, I posted this on my Level of the Playing Field Facebook group just the other day. Imagine going into Best Buy and you're going to buy a big screen TV and it says $1,500 plus 300 O&P on the, price, the big yellow price tag at Best Buy. So, is se- would separating out O and P bring clarity to the consumer or confusion? It's just going to bring bring some anger, probably, and hostility. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going to say, "Well, I don't want, I don't want that three hundred O and P thing. Uh, yeah. I'll just take the fifteen hundred dollars." Right. Yeah. It doesn't bring clarity. It brings confusion. Why would anyone in their right mind price their products or services that way? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. No one in their no. right mind would. But home builders don't do that. Construction companies that that build commercial buildings, they don't do that. In fact, no no retail roofer does that. No. Non insurance roof, you know, right. you're doing a cash a cash customer or you're financing, they don't do that. No one does that except us. Because the insurance industry has persuaded us that that's the way it has to be. What other nonsense? Yeah. Right. Right. Well, like when you get an Xactimate from an insurance company, why does it always seem like the pricing on it is so outdated? You know, or, or do they do they adjust it every so often? Why does it seem like it just it's never enough? So the insurance, I mean, I'm sorry, the, um, the um, Xactimate pricing, what they do is... Um, Supposedly, they update everything on a monthly basis. But you can have a price increase. I remember when softball size hail hit Wiley, Texas about three, four years ago. And labor doubled overnight. It was three months before Xactimate finally started to raise the labor rate for that area in east of Dallas, Wiley, from that um, softball size hail. Right. Now, so is that... Xactimate is very sluggish in their pricing. Right. It... And that is, if, that is if you're able to actually use Xactimate pricing. Some of these policies now are starting to say that they owe for, for the price on the date of loss, not the date of, of the project. Oh, okay, which could be three months later. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. Now, when they adjust those prices, is that like a like a state by state thing or region by region or is that a national thing like if they're raising prices to match today's uh... it's re- it's it's, re- it's re- regional okay like like see Dallas and Fort Worth is an area and then if you go out um, Waco that's south of Dallas Fort Worth that's another area and then Austin south of that that's another area then you go south to San Antonio that's another area 
And those are all within the state of Texas, as wow. an example. Right on, right on. So let's talk about a, 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 ARC and, I'm sorry, a, uh, that's misspelled in there, sorry. I'm going off of uh, some notes here. Uh, sure, sure. So the, uh, crap, I'm having AOB a, the, and AOC? Yeah, the, the, a, the, the ACV and the RCV. Tell us the difference oh. between that and the pros and cons between that. Okay, so uh, the, the easiest way to explain this is with an automobile. It's the easiest to grasp the concept. So I drive a 2017 F-150. I have insurance. On, I have collision insurance on this truck. So let's say that I, I, I'm in a collision and this truck is totaled. Uh, the damage to it is is so severe that it can't be repaired. Total loss. All right. They're going to give me the money for a 2017 F-150, not a 2022. Right. It's not. It's. I, I'm not better off. I'm even. It's, that's called indemnification. You're. You're made whole. I had a 2017. Now they give me the money for another 2017. I break even. That's ACV. Actual cash value. That's a depreciated value. Not 2022 replacement. 2017 depreciated. If you could buy an insurance policy on an automobile that was a replacement cost. Then you would get new for old. Instead of getting a, the money for a 2017, that would give you the money for a 2022. That's what's known as a betterment policy. Because I had an old truck, now I have a new one. And it's better. Hence, betterment policy. So indemnification is ACV, depreciated value. And replacement cost is brand new. So if my, in fact, my roof was total by hell in February and I haven't replaced it yet but so I had an old roof it was like five years old and because I have replacement cost coverage they're going to pay for a brand new roof replacement cost and I only have to be out of pocket my deductible if I had ACV coverage which isn't allowed if you have a mortgage the mortgage companies won't allow that but let's say that, I, that uh, I paid off my mortgage, I own my house free and clear, and for some weird reason, I decided to have an ACV policy on my home. Then what they would do is they would depreciate my roof based on its age and wear and tear, and then they would give me the, that depreciated amount so now I'm out of pocket my deductible and the depreciation. So let's say that my roof is a $50,000 roof and it has $10,000 in depreciation. And I have a $5,000 deductible, let's say. So I have to come out of pocket the $5,000 deductible and I have to come out of pocket the $10,000 in depreciation because they're only going to pay me $35,000. So they subtract out ten dollars for the depreciation, they subtract out, subtract out five dollars for the deductible, and they give me thirty-five thousand dollars. That makes sense. And I'm, I'm out of pocket. Mm -hmm. I'm out of pocket thirty fifteen thousand. Whereas if I had a replacement cost, I would only be out my deductible, and um, and I'd be out the five thousand. Gotcha. Yeah. So gotcha. I'd save a lot of money. I'd save a lot of money on premiums by having the the, the El Cheapo Cinco yeah. policy. If I don't ever have a if I never have a claim, then hey, that's great. But if you do. Uh, man, they could really knock you in the dauber. If you have an older home with with older building materials, older roof, it could really knock you in the dauber. Mm -hmm. And now they have this thing called the roof surface payment schedule. Uh, if you have a policy with the RSPS roof payment, uh, roof surface payment schedule, for every year the roof ages, they take 3% of coverage off. So after 10 years, 10 times 3 is 30%. After 10 years, you only have 70% coverage on the roof. Wow. After 20 years, 20 times 3 is 60. So you only have 40% coverage on the roof. See, that's no longer a replacement cost policy. Mm -mm. That's, a, that's an ACV policy with replacement cost benefits, like for fire losses and stuff. Mm -hmm. but, but the roof is paid on a depreciation schedule 
annually. Wow. And, and no one who has those knows that they have them. Yeah, that's they don't what know I was going to ask them you. Until they have a claim and they get their estimate and it, and they and they see they're taking off, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for this RSPS and they have no idea what it even is. Yeah, yeah. That they never agreed to it, and yet there it is. Right. You know, and that's what I was going to ask you. So it's be, so the insurance companies are basically dictating what kind of coverage you're going to have on your home. Right? Is that what you're saying? So a homeowner can't even pick and choose basically what they want covered, right? The insurance company. To some dictating. degree, to some degree you can. Um, you know, um, you can pick and choose the insurance company, obviously. You can pick and choose whether you want ACD coverage or replacement cost coverage. You can, um, you can increase your um, policy limits on your dwelling. You can certainly increase your policy limits on other structures, what's known as appurtenant private structures. You can increase your policy limits on your your contents. You know, that's all your stuff. Uh, your contents is on an ACV basis. You can upgrade to replacement cost coverage on your contents. You can increase your coverage on your additional living expenses if you have to move out of the house. In the event of a large loss, you know, a fire or a big water loss or something, you have to be out of the house for a week or a month or whatever while the project is going on. Uh, that's the additional living expense coverage. You can increase that. You can increase your coverage for liability. That's lawsuit protection. Uh, medical payments in case someone gets injured on your property and, and you have to call an ambulance or there's hospital bills. Uh, you can increase the coverage on that. You can get a an umbrella liability policy, stuff like that. So you do have some flexibility. Um, most people are price shoppers, and they buy the cheapest policy they possibly can. And as with all things, um, you get what you pay for, and you pay for what you get. Yeah. And if you buy the cheap coverage, that's what you're going to get. And you're going to be left holding the bag if you ever have a loss. And if you have a substantial loss. You could be left holding the bag ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, that's crazy. And especially and, like on a fire, a big fire loss or something. Yeah, and like you uh, said, so the the policy owners usually don't even know this, and and I'm guessing this is stuff that's hidden. In, it's 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 hidden in the fine print. I'm guessing. He may yeah. not have heard you. Yeah. Yeah. Did did you and did so, you catch that, Steve? Uh, hey, insurance agent. Yeah, insurance agents back in the day, they actually were knowledgeable, and they would educate their consumers, but not anymore. They're just glorified salesmen now. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, they probably aren't even educated that well to begin with in what most of the policies. What they're insuring. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Nope. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's that's wild, man. That is that good information. That, that these roof service payments, many of these agents don't even know that the insurance companies are are putting these roof surface payment schedules and all that sort of thing into policies at the renewal. They don't mm -hmm. even know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. We ran into a situation. There's, there's a couple, glorified salesmen nowadays. Yes, yeah, for sure. That That's really all it is. It, there's no personal touch to it anymore like it was back in the day. Like you had your neighborhood you know, policy broker that, mm -hmm. that would come and visit you and help you update your policy at renewal time and things like that. Right. Nowadays, they, they don't just... It would don't. explain things to you. Yes. And ask you questions about well, what, your, what your coverage needs are and all that. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. We ran into a situation a couple months ago down in Delaware, okay, right, right along the, uh, the coast there. And down there, there's a lot of uh, areas that have double wide trailers or, or modular homes or, or whatever you want to call them, a trailer, basically. Mm -hmm. what, we were, what we were running into is, is that they didn't necessarily have homeowner's insurance. They had like a, like a, almost like a vehicle insurance. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what it is, it's actually like a Winnebago or, you know, like a, an RV. Mm -hmm. it's, actually an, it's, it's actually an RV policy. Okay. So tell us, tell us the difference between a uh, homeowner uh, policy or an RV policy, um, and, and what should we have done to try to get their roof paid for? So what do homes do over time? 
generally speaking, they go up in value. Yes. What about RVs? Do they, they go up in value over time? No. Mm-hmm. Not no, usually, they, no. They, they diminish in value over time. Mm-hmm. Likewise, likewise with a trailer house. I mean, you could call it a manufactured home if you want to. Right. It's a trailer house in mm-hmm. a trailer park. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what it is. That's exactly what right? it is. And, uh, and they go, I mean, maybe it's a double wide, so it's a nicer trailer house. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and so that's the reason why um, if you're going to want a homeowner's policy, you have to have an actual foundation built underneath a manufactured home, and you have to take the tongue and the wheels off. Mm. And then you actually, so if you actually, if you actually put a real foundation under it, and, um, and you take the wheels off and the tongue, then it could actually qualify for homeowner's policy. Okay. 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 But most people in manufactured homes don't even know that, but it's true. Yeah, that's what we were running into. They didn't even know. They they didn't. No, they don't know. And what's crazy, we ran across so many people that didn't even have homeowners insurance or any type of insurance whatsoever on their trailer. Yeah, yeah, because you can own that outright because you know they're they're it's not ex, as expensive as a home. Yeah, they're relatively. So maybe in ten year ten years they pay the thing off. And they're happy living like that. Yeah. You know, there, you know that there's in Arkansas more people live in manufactured homes, trailer parks, than live in regular homes in, in the state of Arkansas. I can believe that, but why do you think that? That's is? how ex- that's how extensive it is in Arkansas. Bunch of, and they're just quite happy to live in a trailer house. I mean, yeah. whatever, I guess. Uh, as long as they're happy, I ain't good for them. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so you can have, so you can pay the thing off in ten years. And, and say, you know what? I don't have to. I don't have to have it, homeowners insurance, so I'm just not gonna. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, if there's any any damage whatsoever, it's out of pocket because yeah. they don't have any coverage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, with such a but shame. But mortgage, mortgage, mortgage companies require that you have coverage. Exactly. Because right. they have a financial interest if it burns to the ground or something. Right. Of course. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, of course. And it, it was a shame because there was so much hail in this area. Chris, you remember. Yeah, yeah. Dude, people's houses were just getting destroyed by hail, but unfortunately, 90% of it was a trailer trailer, trailer parks. Yeah. Um, and most people either didn't have any type of insurance whatsoever, or it was more like a vehicle insurance and was handled didn't differently. Cover any of that. And and because of the the age of the home, it was it just they gave them a thousand bucks for a twelve thousand dollar roof, basically with a yeah. five hundred dollar deductible. Right. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Now some of that some of that may have been a scam. They may have actually o- owed for the replacement of the roof, and they knew they were dealing with unsophisticated consumers. And they actually took advantage of them, possibly. I'd have right. to look at the, at, at, I'd have to read the policy. Like, for example, a foremost, you may have, a lot of those trailer house policies, manufactured homes are, mm-hmm. are insured by foremost, which is owned by farmers. And uh, a lot of those foremost policies do provide coverage for the roof. But what they don't do is, um, um, they may have a they may have cosmetic damage exclusions or especially on, on on metal because you know the roof of a lot of those trailer houses are are you know um, sheet metal yes yeah 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 this yeah, unfortunately sense. wasn't a they weren't metal roofs uh, down there a lot of those places have to have peak roofs on it mm-hmm. or if they don't they either have to m- remove the trailer or they have to build a peak roof on it a guy I know just actually went through that. But uh, let me see what else here. We might have some more questions here. Um, so when it comes to hail damage, and the homeowner has three tab shingles, why is there? Why are they still pushing for repairs when they know older three tab shingles are a different size than the newer three tab shingles? Um, actually, they're not different size. They're um, they're twelve inches wide, uh, thirty six inches wide, and you have like a uh, what a five and a quarter is it five or five and a quarter inch exposure on a three tab yeah about that somewhere it's so long i can't remember i think it's five and a quarter yeah inch exposure so three tabs now laminate shingles have gone from from 36 inches to to a meter right um but but three tabs have not three tabs are still three feet wide 36 okay. inches and so they're the same size and and uh, the manufacturer stopped making 
a 20 year three tab and they make a 25. Yes. But some of those manufacturers, the 25 year doesn't weigh any more than the, the old 20 year and it's still the same thickness. Mm hmm. You know, the bundle weighs 70 pounds or whatever. Right. So they're just, you know, it's it's like back in the day, I don't know if you've been doing this long enough, like 20 years ago, uh, Atlas turned their uh, 20 into 25. They turned their 30 into 35. They're 40 into 45. Uh, and um, so they had, a tw <laughs> they had a 25, 30, and a 40. And they added five years to each. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of manufacturers added 10 years. So then you have a 30, 40, and 50. Right. Uh, but they didn't, they're still the exact same thickness and weight as they were before. So it's a, it, was, it was just a marketing ploy. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was much, it was a bunch of nonsense. Uh, and uh, so that's what the, anyway, it's just marketing. Yeah. And so. The reason why they want to pay for repairs is because they want to keep the money for the replacement. If they can pay $1,000 for repairs instead of $12,000 to replace the roof, they just save themselves a cool $11,000 and do that a 1,000 times Seriously. in a store. Yeah. And that's $11 million they save them, themselves. Um, so I made a post on Love of the Playing Field just the other day. So what you do is when, when an adjuster says this roof is repairable and you don't believe that legitimately don't believe that it is ask them the following question under what circumstances in your opinion would a roof be unrepairable in other words there is enough damage to warrant replacement and then you shut up and you let silence do its work and you wait for a response from them Mm -hmm. If they say, like one of the posters yesterday, um, the guy made a post on Love of the Playing Field where he had an adjuster say there's no circumstance. I mean, the guy put it in writing. There's no circumstance where a roof is, is unrepairable. Well, sure there are. I have 11 circumstances in my book, Love of the Playing Field. Um, 11 circumstances that teach you 11 different things that make roofs unrepairable. And, uh, and boy, I'm, man, I know a bunch of liars that would love to take a case like that. Mm -hmm. I would love to be in the courtroom when the lawyer asks them, or in the deposition or in the courtroom when the lawyer asks them whether, is it true that you believe every roof is repairable? S sitting there in the hot seat in front of a jury of 12. I'd like to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So, Steve, let's circle back to the beginning. Was there something that happened like back 26 years ago when you got into this industry? Did, did something dramatic happen in your life? Because obviously um, you're a seasoned veteran, OK, in, in, in this industry now. But prior to that, like what what pushed you into this industry did something dramatic happen or, or i mean i guess it doesn't necessarily oh. have to be something dramatic but what a lot of times when people shift gears and get into a different trade or or something that, like something happens in their life what was there something that happened that got you into this industry so in my early 20s i was a uh, firefighter in austin then a, then a paramedic then a police officer <clears throat> i did that until i was 25 and then i realized that uh, you know, I wanted to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> Can't well, do you know, you're, you're, 20, you're, 20, <laughs> you're 25 years old, you know, and you notice that the rich guys get the gorgeous women and, you know, and, and you kind of want that sort of thing at 25. And not that I don't want to know, but at 25, you definitely do. <laughs> and so I, I determined that uh, I determined that I was going to go into sales because I knew a bunch of salesmen that were millionaires. And they were millionaires in sales. So I started studying sales. That's when I was 25. That was 36 years ago. And uh, and uh, I was and I was doing that. In fact, I was selling those um, point of sale credit card machines. You know, you, mm -hmm. you swipe your card through the thing. Yep. And because I would go in and I would sell a business on taking credit cards, and they would use my machine that that they bought. Uh, I got a cut off of every swipe. 
And so you could build a book of business so that every, you know, you could have a thousand businesses out there and every time one of those businesses swipes a client's card, you get money put into your account. Wow. And, uh, and I was doing that and I had built a really nice book of business and then all of a sudden the bank sold out to a different bank. Mm-hmm. And um, and the new bank said, everyone starts off, you lo- lose your entire book of business and you have to start off at ground zero all over again. Oh, my. And talk about blowing all the wind out of your sails. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man. And so I said, well, what's to stop me from getting screwed over? You know, screw me once, shame on you. But right. screw me twice, shame on me. So I said, fine, I'm going to stop doing this. Oh, it's funny, so I had sold two of these machines to this guy, Hal, the contractor in Plano, Texas, near Dallas. And he had said, no, 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 I don't want any of those credit card machines. I've been, you know, a, a cash or, or handwritten right. check business all these years. I don't want one. And then 30 minutes later, he had bought two. And so he goes, hey, man, I want you to come sell roofs for me. I says, no, I have the deal going, book of business, all that. And so right after I quit working for the bank, I went back over there and I said, hey, is that deal back on? I mean, is that deal still on? I can sell roofs for you. And uh, actually, the guy was a great teacher. He really did an excellent job of teaching me about construction because I knew zero about construction 28 years ago when I started. I mean, mm-hmm. I didn't know the difference between a ceiling joist and a rafter. Right. Nothing. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I would helped my dad roof our house when I was 16 years old, but I wasn't paying attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> 16 years old. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and he also taught me about how in the insurance industry works and adjusters and, and that sort of thing. So I did learn those two really good things from, from Hal, uh, but he was just a con man and a liar. So that's why I started my own business. So that's kind of how I, uh, I, I broke into this business. Yeah. Okay. What was the, what was the proudest, what's the proudest moment in your career? Um, oh, good question. When I, when I see people, who I, I do a lot of teaching teaching people how to get in the top one percent, mm-hmm. how to you know be a top performer. And when I see people just knock it out of the park, there's a young lady that went to our commercial roofing academy. She's a residential roofer. She's like 26 years old. She's been in roofing for about two years, and she came in, and two months after our uh, two day kickoff school on our commercial roofing academy, she sold a 1.6 million dollar roof. Wow. Wow. 26 years old. Yes. One, a one man, one man shop, or in her case, one woman shop. Um, she was just out of her mind excited. This is going to change her life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That kind of stuff really, like, man, that's what's fun. That's it's becoming when wise. People, when people yeah. take what you teach them and actually apply it and execute on it, and they get results like that, mm-hmm. now that's fun. Yeah. And that's what I live to, to do is, is help people get those kind of results. Absolutely. But, you know, some people, you know, you, can, you, can't lead, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So, yep. yeah. Totally that's understand very, that. That's very, very, totally. very good point. So you said the, the what, the Commercial Roofing Academy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, Paul Reed and I started. A, a, yeah. We, we, we take guys who originally, uh, it's funny. So when we first started this, my idea was that we would take residential guys and teach them the commercial roofing with uh, business, so they didn't have to make all the, you know, the stupid dumb mistakes that we make due to lack of knowledge and you know shooting from the hip and and learning by trial and error like mm-hmm. most of us learn in business. Mm-hmm. And uh, so originally we saw that it would would be all residential guys wanting to break into commercial. What we found is 50% of our students are commercial guys that have been shooting from the hip, learning this business by trial and error, by the seat of their pants, and paying a whole bunch of that dumb tax. You know, you don't know what you don't know. Yes. And and so they, um, 50% of our students are commercial roofers. Mm, That's great. And they come in to learn... They come in to learn from these guys that have been doing it decades mm-hmm. and have paid all the dumb tax and they've learned all these things. And, and so they learn the mistakes these other very successful commercial roofing companies are doing. They learn and they, they learn the mistakes they've made because these guys are very candid 
about those mistakes, and uh, so they at least they at least don't make those. Mm-hmm. And so that's been a really fun school. Um, we're doing that. Um, that that's been a, a very exciting. Yeah. When's yeah. the next one, and where's it being held? Um, actually, in a little over a week, we're doing a uh, so it's a twelve month class, mm. the Commercial Roofing Academy. I didn't come on here to pitch this. I know. Um, but it's a it's a twelve month class, and we do a two day kickoff school. And we're doing one in Denver coming up July. The evening of July 14th is the meet and greet, and then all day long the 15th and 16th in Denver. Okay. Nice. That's cool. Yeah, That's if anybody's interested stuff. in giving me a ring, I'll be happy to tell them about yeah, it. We're going to be doing another kickoff school in about two months. Absolutely. I got awesome. I got another question, another personal question. So if you had the opportunity of, of doing this all over again, what would you change? Hmm, what would I change? You know, I ask people that question. It's a really good question. Uh, huh. I I would have got I would have gone into commercial roofing from the beginning. Uh, man, so <laughs> I could I could sell a roof a week, fifty roofs a year, make twenty thousand dollars a piece. Right, a full-blown project mm-hmm. like hell, hell or win loss type work, make a million dollars, or I can sell one million dollar roof and make the same amount of money. No, <laughs> and so uh, I would have done that. I would have started doing commercial. In fact, my uh, my son Dominic, who's 22, he's a uh, he's going to do residential for one year. That's what I taught him. I said, do residential for one year, generate a whole bunch of revenue, so you got enough money sitting there in the bank in your in your um, company's account to carry you because it's going to take you a year to cultivate the relationships before you're going to get your first work and uh, as a commercial roofer. And his second year in business, he's going to start doing commercial roofing. So I got into commercial roofing a lot sooner, which is what I'm having Dominic do. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say yep. by not doing that, that would be one of your biggest regrets of not getting Yeah, and also, and, okay. and the other thing is nowadays I'm telling people they better – uh, the better if you don't already have a robust retail roofing business or, or division you need to do that because if you're relying on, on claims mm-hmm. uh, you know the insurance companies are paying less and less and less for roofs they're doing ACV policies they're doing the roof surface payment schedule they're doing all these things so that they pay far less on commercial roofs and um, so a company would be very wise to have a robust retail roofing division so you're not so dependent on insurance claims. In fact, I think you're foolish yeah. if you don't do that. Yeah, that, yeah, that's actually a really good nugget that you just dropped right there because mm-hmm. I think – Obviously, that's been a hot topic throughout the entire industry on just about every roofing Facebook page out there. You know the the you know the the storm restoration versus retail and and all that yep. stuff. And it's we're kind of neutral when it comes to all that. We yeah. we want to be good at all of it. You, you know what I mean? We 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 are foremost uh, first and foremost. You know we we do a lot of new construction and also retail. And, and uh, you know, dabble with storms. When a storm comes through, obviously we we work it the best as we can. We're up here in old Pennsylvania. Yeah, we don't so get many we, storms. We get, you know, we get high winds and stuff like that. But now we do have a location down outside of uh, Ocean City, Maryland. And it's yes. kind of in between Virginia and Ocean City, Maryland. So we will get a coastal storm that comes up through there once maybe twice a year and it's usually high winds some hail but but mainly high winds and you uh, bet. so we we want to be there so we don't want to chase it we kind of want to catch it and of course we're going to take advantage of it when it comes through but that's not what we're relying on but we mm-hmm. want to know the game so we can play the rules we got to know the rules so we can play Good. the game and um but retail i would say is is definitely like you said the future um, get good at it. Figure it out. Get your salespeople trained up. Get your CRM, you know, program to to uh, track your money. You know, profit overhead, kind of like what you were talking about. Basically the same thing. And and obviously new construction has been our has been our vehicle. And a, and a lot of guys don't like to mess with new construction. But I think if you can do insurance work, 
you can definitely do new construction because oh all, sure all of the moving parts mm -hmm. and the jerking around that the insurance companies do if you really take the time welcome to a national builder right right so if you take the time <laughs> yeah, that yeah, you yeah. put into to get paid and do a supplement and all that stuff and all the people that are involved if you really looked at your overhead to just do uh storm restoration mm -hmm. well new construction you make really three phone calls that's it you receive a purchase order you call abc up you call a subcontractor up and then, okay, so the fourth phone call comes in, you gotta send guys out to put the roof boots on. So with yep. the least you know, mm -hmm. amount of overhead compared to storm restoration, it honestly, at the end of the it's, day, it washes out. It's 30 steps, it's mm -hmm. 30 steps. Yes. Right. Instead, of, instead of four steps, it's 30. Right. Yeah, and not only that, man, you don't have to wait six months to get paid. Seriously. Exactly. <laughs> unless you're not paying attention. Unless, unless, yes, unless, unless you're, you're doing not a government. Paying <laughs> Right. Unless you're doing a government project, and then you can wait six months. Yes. Yeah. Well, which sometimes that's fine. <laughs> because it's the money's so you just have to have a a, a really good operating account that's yes. going to carry you right. until you get paid, and then man, then you just kill it. Right. And yeah. we're fortunate enough, Vic, who actually is behind the scenes here, he's the one that bids all that kind of work for us. So we'll bid, you know. Uh, state federal funded you know section 8 housing and stuff like that but the cool thing about that is is vic's job is to keep the pipeline full so he's bidding things that are two years out six months out nine months out and trying yep. to keep that pipeline full and there's there's a lot of companies that can't sustain that type really? of business you know capital wise or or finance them basically for a while and carry that and float that so it's nice that we've been able to put ourselves in that financial position where we can mm -hmm. carry a job. Then some of those jobs, Christ could could carry on for a year and a half, based upon how many units they're building or, or how big the units are and and things like that. But again, that's that's one more step that we're trying to do to future proof our business. Yeah, we've 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 spread ourselves out in so many different facets of the construction industry. You know, between investment work new construction, retail, yeah. that kinds of stuff that, you know, no matter where the market goes, no matter what happens with the economy, mm -hmm. um, shits, people are either going to be buying houses or they're going to be building them or they're going to be renting them or they're going to be fixing the current ones up. Like somewhere, like construction is never going to stop. It's just what kind of construction is going to be going on. Exactly. Are they going to be and roofs are gonna, right. And roofs are going to be wearing out and leaking, especially exactly. like commercial roofs. Exactly. They're going to be wearing out and leaking because mm -hmm. those commercial property owners want to stretch the life of a roof out as long as possible. And once they get over 20 years old, uh, that's when they start leaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's when the repairs become increasingly difficult, and you're probably going to have to replace it soon. Exactly. Yeah. Um, having having a, a a very strong repair business is one of the big secrets that hardly anyone outside of the industry, you know, the, the residential guys, they don't know this. Right. Uh, right. Having a really strong repair business is that same type of pipeline you were talking about with with your fellow. When you say his name is Vic. Yep. Mm -hmm. Vic. Yeah. Uh, same kind of thing is your repair business is you can only repair a roof so many times and you have a, a patch on top of a patch mm -hmm. <laughs> and eventually you know they, they're gonna have to replace the roof mm -hmm. and uh and guess who they're gonna call yeah the guy that's you're, been you're in the roofing company because yeah. you've been doing the repairs all along right um you didn't yeah, try to shove a, a company, roof down their throat right and, and so guess what i'm going to be teaching dominic to do also repairs uh, man have that's right lots of repairs yes mm -hmm. Especially in commercial. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. Hey, think about it. So, so the average commercial roof la is, is has about a twenty year lifespan. So the commercial property owner is going to try to stretch it, stretch it twenty five years, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Of course he is. So that means that about four percent, you know, twenty five years, four percent of them are one year old, four four percent of them are two years old, five years old, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty five years old. Each age is 4%. 4 percent. Four times mm -hmm. 25 is 100 percent of the roofs out there. So roughly 20 percent of the roofs are 20 years old and older. Wow. Statistically, mathematically, right? Mm -hmm. That means that they definitely need repairs, and it won't be long before they'll need replacement. Mm -hmm. So if you have, if if you're the biggest commercial roof repair company in your town and in your city, you're 
20, how many commercial buildings do you drive by every day? Yeah, that you don't even realize. 20% of them have, 20% of them have worn out roofs that are leaking. Mm -hmm. Or they're about to leak, and they don't know about you. Mm -hmm. So you start marketing to those guys, and when they do have a need, they call you up because you're the, because you're the only one, only one actually reaching out to them and you do the repair and you do another repair, another repair, and then pretty soon uh, you're looking at a replacement or a hybrid system, a coating or something like that. And, uh, and then you get, you know, the big job out of it. Yeah. And uh, you're just cultivating a relationship and you're providing a service because they're not looking to replace their roof. That's the reason why they're, multi-millionaires and they have lots of commercial properties because they're not running around spending a bunch of money they don't need to right so they're looking for someone to repair their roof right and extend his life to like 25 years right mm -hmm. and if, so you be that person you be the person that, uh, that that does the repairs on one out of five commercial roofs that you drive by every day you be that guy yeah. and you build your business that way and uh, and then you pay yourself Seventy-five thousand dollars a year, and leave the rest of the money in your operating account, and you grow up a really big operating account of a few million bucks, and that can carry you to do those those you know those government projects you were talking about because you because you're not desperate for cash. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Steve, I want to ask anyway. you kind of a personal question, man. So yeah. I, I from what I've learned over this past you know fifty some minutes here, it seems like you've had a pretty successful career. You know, you're happy, you're doing what you love to do. Was there ever a point throughout this entire ride that you would say was a low point? Can you identify that point, and what did you do to get out of that low point? Um, no. No? No, everything, everything that I've done, <clears throat> it's almost as if the Lord has just rolled out, like, this red carpet, mm -hmm. and I've just gone from one thing and then that season will be over, and I go to the next thing, and I do that for that season. And when that season comes to an end, I do the next thing. And when that season comes to an end, I do the next thing. And in in my particular case, um, any one of those things, if I hadn't done them, then I wouldn't be able to be where I am and know what I know, because I wouldn't have experienced all those things. And it's like the Lord rigged it all up to get me to where I am today. Yeah. And so, and I've enjoyed the entire ride all the way here. So I've not really had any. Uh, yeah, I've never just reminded me of right there, man. I just watched a video the other day of Gary V talking about you know yeah, yeah. what when when he's going to retire, and he's like, honestly, man, I just love what I fucking do, and I I'm so aware with myself and what I love that when that time comes that if I just want to go fishing all day on a beach, I'll recognize that and that's what I'll do. But it yeah. sounds like you're, you're really true to yourself and you, you really are able to identify what makes you happy and you've just kind of rode that wave and wherever that wave kind of took you, man, that's pretty cool, man. Mm -hmm. That's good that yeah. a lot of people can't identify that. No. no. As, as zero, I have zero intent on retiring. But if I just one day want to take off a month and go to Europe, then I'll just take off a month and go to Europe. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> right yeah. and, and I'll just say, you know what? Oh, I'm booked, you know, in the month of November or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I'm sorry I'm booked. You know, we'll have to schedule something in December. Right. I don't have to say what I'm doing in November. No. I don't yeah. have to say that I'm in I'm Europe. Booked. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I'm booked. That's right. I love that. And Chris, that was such a great <laughs> question. I was waiting for like this big dramatic or Yeah, well this one time, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. But the way that you rolled that into it and it was such a great response. But why do you think that was? Like, what was was it your mindset? Was it your behavior because you were doing the next right thing? Why do you feel like God unrolled that red carpet for you, man? Uh, well, a mindset has a lot to do with it, but I've learned to be dependent on him as opposed to being dependent on Steve. When you're young and, and you think that, you know, your toes are tapping, you think you're smart and mm -hmm. you got it all going on and all that sort of thing, especially if you're successful, at an early age, you really like it's not even healthy, maybe, to be too successful at a young age. Yeah. Because you you get you get the big head and you start getting this ego and complacent. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, I've just learned to be dependent on the Lord and not dependent on Steve, not dependent on my own uh, mental prowess, and that I'm all that smart. And um, so, Amen. for me, I, I found that uh, you know when I when I'm busy doing his will 
and I'm dependent on him, he blesses me like crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's just my own, that's how it's unfolded in my life. Yeah. yeah, that's that's crazy. That's really awesome, man. Yeah. I'm really happy for Steve, you. Steve, I feel like there's so many things I want to ask you because I feel like there's <laughs> so much shit that you know. But unfortunately, <laughs> I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, man. I, I know you're busy as hell, um, but I definitely and I know Chris feels mm -hmm. the same way and Vic feels the same way. I would definitely like to get you on the show. Uh, more uh, once again or maybe with eric or, or with paul and those guys and and really just awesome. just cut it up and really pick your brain and I, i'd like to run around our shop our office and gather up a bunch of questions and of course gain it for free from you guys because we manipulate you to come on the show so we don't have to pay for your <laughs> services <laughs> no i'm happy to i'm happy to Get on here. I love helping people out. Yeah, so. man. No, yeah. You're, it's all good. You're a cool dude, man. And, and you responded really quickly when we reached out to you. You were like, sure, man, let's do this. And and we had to just make sure the dates lined up. But you were probably one of the quickest people to respond back to me of like, yeah, when do you want to do it? So thank you so much for that and being humble and and uh, coming on sure. our show and, and spreading the knowledge that you have. I know Lauren has probably taken notes this entire time and there you go. To get in front of the sales team tomorrow and yeah. and kick some ass and take some names. So thank you so much, Chris. Do you have any other questions for him? Um, nah, man, I don't. I, uh, I appreciate your time, Steve. And, and like Ty said, I feel like you are a wealth of knowledge mm -hmm. that I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a lot more prepared with a lot more questions. Um, cause I think that, that there's, there's an aspect of, of the industry that we've never had on this show before. You're the first person yeah. of, of your kind on here. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can do the industry a good service to be more prepared with questions next time on, yeah. you know, and really dive into, into your head and, and you know, what you've, what you've accomplished over your career and stuff and, and the sweat and, you know, the sweat equity that you've put into it. So. Um, well, let's yeah, do man. it. I'd like that very much. Yeah. Me too. Awesome, dude. Awesome. But, we'll keep but, kicking ass, buddy. Way, are you guys members of Level the Playing Field, the Facebook group? No, I don't think so. But I would love to be. Yeah, me too. So let me let me tell you how your your audience can join. They can join for free. Mm -hmm. um, it's really priced right. <laughs> so so if they text the word forum, F O R U M, forum to the following phone number two one four four nine six fifty one eighty two, they can join for free. Uh, the number again, text the word forum to 214-496-5182. If they text the word ebook to that same phone number, no dash, no hyphen, just E-B-O-O-K, -O -O to the same phone number, they can download my book for free, Level the Playing Field. Awesome. I just did it right now, man. Cool. Yep, yep. Right here live. And so there... There's y'all's free takeaway for the day. Thank you. My man. Seriously. Thank you very of much, course. Steve. Thank you for everything that you contribute to the industry, man. Everything that you well, do. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's much appreciated, and, and not not just by ourselves, but all the viewers. You know, people mm -hmm. will watch this on the replay. We post these in a lot of roofing groups and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. you too. Um, if anyone needs to get a hold of you, Steve, if anyone has any kind of questions or would like any of your services, um, anyone that's watching or anyone on the replay, how can somebody go about doing that and getting a hold of you? So text, uh, they can just call me, two one my cell phone number here in Dallas is 214-244-2639. Uh, we do appraisal services for your clients that have an insurance claim when the insurance companies refuse to be reasonable. Uh, we write estimates uh, for contractors. Uh, we, uh, we have a very good contract package that has all the paperwork necessary for a roofing contracting business um to uh to run their business it's like 25 different documents all the contracts and everything like that that's necessary to run your business both at a retail and an insurance both all those contracts are in there uh so we do that in our contractor pro docs and just a bunch of other stuff we and do. is that residential or is that commercial both awesome awesome very good cool yep, yep. Uh, good good question both. yeah good stuff steve well thank yeah. you so much man you are the man you're the og 
for real. And and when when I when I said seasoned veteran, I didn't mean that in a in a negative way. I sincerely feel like I feel like I'm I'm getting maybe to that veteran, but you're the seasoned veteran, homie. So yeah. well, you're very kind. Yes. My business partner has been doing this 51 years. Whoa! Holy crap! Well, next time bring him yeah. with you. We'll do a two-hour special of behind the tool belt, man, and just listen to you guys just rap and and we'll we'll prepare better and then everyone can chime in and ask their questions in the comments and you guys can just go to town excellent sounds good yeah i love yeah. it awesome well safe travel thank you Steve. very you much make, for yeah. inviting me yeah, yeah. Uh, thank, th you. thank you for for accepting man we're, we're humbled man yeah yeah, yep. yeah for sure good. So safe travels to Houston, um, yes. and ha have a right. have a good uh, have a good class and everything, and and wish you well, and we'll see you soon. Excellent, thanks. Yep. TC Backer family, thank you guys for tuning in. If you guys not have done have done so already, make sure you hop over to the Facebook page, um, like that, give this a share out, um, check us out on YouTube, the Behind the Tool Belt yes. YouTube. Make subscribe. sure you guys subscribe to that man. We got to get our subscribers up before we can start making some changes to the studio and, yes. and how how we do this live format. So make sure you guys show some love to that. Um, as always, we appreciate you guys for always supporting us and tuning in, um, and we will catch you guys. Next next week at 7 p.m. on Wednesday for episode 133. Bam. See you.